So while we get set up down here, <clears throat> just to tell you what our next plan is, we are going to go through and demonstrate every single one of these stations. So the reason to do this is so that the camera in the back can see what each station is about. So we're going to try to keep the line of sight relatively clear from the camera to, yes, to the, uh, to the, to the mannequins. And so the camera is going to film, and each, each one of the providers is going to take us through one element of, of these things. And then we want you to come on down and we want you to try things that you've never tried before. If you've done nasogastric tubes and Foley's, you don't need to learn it again. On the other hand, if you want to try it, you know, one of the central lines, you want to use the ultrasound, these are all things that you can try, and certainly the, uh, the ventilator. Okay, and we'll be here as long as you guys have interest, as long as you ha are staying, we'll, we're going to hang out, okay? Hi. Can everybody hear me okay? My name's Taylor. I'm one of the nurses in the surgical ICU. I'm going to go over peripheral IV placement and IO placement, which you guys might not have to do, but if you do, it's good how to know how to do them. So for your peripheral, um, you're going to need IVs. Anything, honestly, anything less than a 20 gauge is not very helpful based on people getting antibiotics, fluids at the rate that they'll flow and things like that. Um, so you're going to get a tourniquet and you will place it around the patient's arm. It'll have to be a little bit snug. And then you can just assess their arm and see you want to go more off of touch than off of sight. You're looking for something that is bouncy and bounces back easy when you press down on it. Um, you can often see veins in people that are like nice and dark and blue, but you try to compress it and there's nothing there. So if you can't press down on it, you're not really going to be able to get an IV catheter into it. So if you found a good vein, you're going to clean off the area with chloroprep or alcohol. Let that dry. Usually while that's drying, they have uh, the IV connecting tubing sets, saline flush. You will hook the flush up to this set, prime it through, and when you're putting in your peripheral, you're obviously going to have gloves on. Yeah, I don't know if you want to open it or not. So what you're going to do is go in at about a, thank you, 15 to 20 degree angle. You don't want to go in at 45, and I usually anchor below the vein because older people often, their veins are very rolly and they don't stay still. So what you're going to do is just go in at a soft angle insert, and once you get flash on this mannequin, you can see it on some of the veins, but not all of them. Once you get flash, you don't want to insert your needle any further. From there, you just insert your catheter. So what you'll do is push the pink part up and advance the pink part, and you'll press this white button that retracts the needle. From there, you can take off your tourniquet, and then you would hook up, thank you, hook up your connector set. Oftentimes you can aspirate a little bit of blood and then you just flush it through. And then there's tegaderms that you can just secure it with and that should be good. That's pretty much it. Okay. Sounds good. Any questions on IVs? Okay. IOs. Um, honestly, the only time I've ever put in IOs is during a code. So it's just when you don't really have time to put in a central line or somebody doesn't have good peripheral access. And as far as stocking, IOs usually aren't on the floors. You're probably going to have to call the ICU anyways just to get them. And I know in the medical ICU, I'm pretty sure all of their, IC or their charge nurses are trained to put them in. In the SICU, most of ours are, but not everybody. So um, it's good for you guys to know how to do them just in case. We have a leg here. Sure. So there are two different places that we normally put the IOs in. One will be the proximal part of your uh, humerus and then the flat part of the proximal tibia. Now, traditionally, the preferred place to go is the humerus just because it's closer to your central circulation and um, it can 
allow for a lot larger amount of fluid. You could put about five liters per hour through a uh, humeral IO site versus the shin, you're only gonna get about one liter per hour. But practically speaking, usually when somebody's coding, you have anesthesia at the head, RT at the head, people doing compressions, it's not always easy to get up to the shoulder, so the shin is often the easier place to go. So as far as insertion, you've got three different types of needles. They're color-coded, and one is blue, one is yellow, and then I don't think there's a pink one in this kit, but pink is generally reserved for pediatrics. The pink is the shortest, it's usually for people under 40 kilograms. And then people above 40 kilograms can either get the yellow or the blue. The yellow is the biggest one, and it is 45 millimeters. The blue is 25 millimeters. So you kind of just have to look at the patient and assess how much subcutaneous tissue they have and which size you think would work better for them. Kind of the rule of thumb, when you come up here and look at the needles, it'll be easier to see, but there are multiple black lines. When you're putting in an IO, what you do is poke through the skin before you start drilling. You wanna be able to see at least one black line outside of the skin. If you can't, the needle's not long enough. So you might as well, I usually always put in the blue one or the yellow one. I don't even put in the pink one, even if it's a frail old person, because you run the risk of having to insert a second needle. So as far as the way that you put them in, it's pretty similar in both sides, um, in the tibia and in the humerus. You wanna avoid putting a site in that has a fracture. And if somebody's had an IO and that's out for the last 48 hours, you wouldn't put one in that area either. But you have your drill. They all come in little kits. I'm gonna use the one that's already open. So. Let's use the yellow needle so you guys can see it better. What you will do, thanks, is you hook it right up to the drill. It has a little magnetic attachment, so it's not gonna click in all the way. You'll wanna locate your landmark, so just because it's a little bit easier to see on the whole leg, we'll do the leg first. Usually, I'm standing on the opposite side of the bed and leaning over. When you go into the shin, you're gonna go in at a 90 degree angle. So it's easier to be on the opposite side of the bed sometimes so you can put your weight behind the drill. You clean the area. There is a cap on the needle that you will remove. So what you'll do is when you're finding the flat part of your shin, I encourage you to all check it on yourselves. It's easier to find on yourself in a non-emergent situation, but it's just a wider part of your shin and there, it's an easy plateau for you to go for. So what you're gonna do is go in at 90 degrees directly over the flat part, push the drill through the skin, and then stop when you hit bone, and then that's when you drill. And what you'll do is you'll feel a release of tension. You can't really feel it because this leg has been drilled into a billion times, but when you feel that pop of tension going away, that means you're inside the marrow. So you don't wanna continue pushing the needle in farther because you could go back through the other side of the bone. So at that point, what you would do is remove the drill and then you unscrew the external needle and this would go in your sharps container. And from here, you got your IO in, but it's not secured. So what you wanna do is put a, there's a securement dressing that goes over the top. These things are kind of telescoped. So say you picked a bigger needle than you needed it's sitting outside of the skin, you can still secure it with the dressing outside of the skin and that's okay. And then you're just going to, this is, should be a 10 cc saline flush that you'll prime the line with. The biggest part about the IO is when you flush the IO, you wanna displace a lot of marrow so then you can start infusing fluid rapidly. So what you'll do is this line is already primed and then you just do like a rapid push and then you can start hooking somebody up to fluids. Um, a lot of times you can aspirate and check to make sure you're in the right place. You should see bone marrow return, but you don't always. You just keep an eye on the leg or the arm, depending on where you put it for extravasation. It's possible that uh, fluid or pressors could be leaking in the people's skin just because of the nature of the procedure, but it works and it's quick and easy if somebody needs resuscitation quickly. Then, 
Um, it's, oh, if they're unconscious, it's not painful. But usually, um, if people are awake when they're getting it, they recommend that you do do a little bit of lidocaine in the IV tubing. The skin, when you puncture through the skin, it supposedly feels like a shot. And the drilling through the bone is not painful. It's the flush of the marrow that is very painful. So that's why you would pre-prime your syringe with lidocaine, and then you would, when you flush your 10cc syringe in, it would disperse that. But again, you're not really gonna put IOs in awake people. If so, you probably have time for a central line. The only difference with when you're inserting it into your humerus is that you go in at a 45 degree angle instead of a 90 degree angle. So the landmarks are a little bit different. I'm gonna use you if you don't mind. So what you have, oops, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. What you have to do is put your arm kind of, your hand behind somebody's shoulder muscle. I don't know the technical terms for all of these things, I'm sorry. And then in the front, and you kind of put your thumbs into the middle and you can feel the humeral head. Feels like a giant golf ball. What you'll wanna do is go down at a 45 degree angle from there. You don't wanna go directly in you want to go down at 45 degrees. And then the flushing and everything is the same. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay. Hello, I'm Kristen. I am the surgical ICU PA. Um, I work with Dr. Stilatos. And this is Lindsay. She's going to, one of the other surgical ICU PAs, and we're going to do a central line. Um, so when you first put the central line in, this is a sterile procedure, so you have to be sterile. So you have a head cap on, you have a face mask, you have sterile gloves, a sterile gown. And um, so you could just pretend that I have all that on right now. <laughs> so I'm going to do a, um, I'm going to go on the right IJ, just because that's the, it's pretty much the easiest and um, it's got the best direction because it goes straight down right into the SVC, uh, right atrium area. So I usually take a look before I go just to make sure that I know where I'm going for my landmarks. So I check. Sometimes I press with my finger before I'm all sterile just to make sure that I can see that the vein's compressing. Then I'm going to start to get my kit all set up. So it's nice when you have somebody that's working with you, you know, having an assistant so that they can hand you what it is that you need. So I'm going to clean with some chlorhexidine prep here. I usually do two of them. Then I'm going to get my sterile um, drape all set up. So it tells you head, so you know where you're going. So plop that down. I just want that out of the way. And there's arrows on these that tell you where you're supposed to go. So I'm going to pull that one forward. And then you can see there's another arrow that points down. Usually whoever's in the room can help pull the sterile dressing all the way down so that it covers the entire bed. Usually just make sure that my, my site that I'm going to has just got my little hole the, in the dressing there. So then for the ultrasound, we have a cover for it. So what I normally do is I put a little bit of gel on the neck, and then I'll put some gel in the cover. And then whoever is assisting me, I usually put the ultrasound in there. And then I'll hand them the very end. And I've got my ultrasound here, and I put my rubber bands on it to keep it in place. And I'm going to go and look with my ultrasound here. I want to make sure that you've got the jelly on the uh, actual probe itself. And then I can see where I'm going. Now, when I go in and I'm looking at the ultrasound, I can see where the vein is because, again, I, it, the vein collapses. So when you push down, it turns flat. And usually you can see the carotid pulsing underneath it. So obviously I don't want to hit the carotid. It's, yeah, it's not very clear. You can see that that's where I'm going. That's my IJ. You can see I can compress it, and you can sort of see it a little bit light up there. So um, 
I'll usually give a little bit of lidocaine to somebody. Um, I'll make a nice little skin wheel. And then you go in at a 45 degree angle and you can sort of see where you are on the ultrasound here. I can see. And you're gonna aspirate back. I can't, I'm at a weird angle here. <laughs> and I've got some blood, come, oh yeah. Sorry, this is my Lidocaine needle. Sorry. I'm like, wait, why isn't it going? <laughs> Not used to having a, a, a helper. <laughs> and again, I'm just going to go in, and I can see where I am, and I get my blood return. Take that off. Usually I'll see blood coming out. And I put my needle, or my wire through. I'm just gonna go in, I can, sometimes it doesn't go in all the way, so you can pull it back. <laughs> Little troubleshooting things to do. What's that? You three separate. Yeah. Normally when you're in the vein, like I said, you can see the blood coming out of the needle. I'm gonna put the wire through, it'll go nice in. Not going in all the way there. And this is a Seldinger technique. I'm gonna take my wire off, or my, sorry, my needle off. And then I'm gonna take my scalpel and I make a tiny little nick in the skin. I don't wanna make it too big because I don't want it to start bleeding all over the place. And then I'm gonna put my dilator on the wire. And there's gonna be a little pressure that you're gonna push through the skin and you'll feel a little pop. Then when you take the dilator off, still gonna hold on to the wire and it's gonna start to bleed a little there. So sometimes I'll take a gauze and just hold it onto the skin there. And I'm gonna put my catheter over the wire. And the wire comes out of the brown port on the central lines. So I feed it through until it's coming out. And once it comes out, I'm gonna hold on to my wire and I'm gonna advance my catheter in. I'm gonna to go to about usually 15 or 16. Then I pull out the wire and I put my finger over the brown port because I don't want any air to get in. And then I put my cap on there. And then I'm going to do my flushes. But again, I'm always gonna aspirate back. So you're gonna aspirate back until you get blood and then you're gonna flush. You're gonna do that for all of the ports, the same thing. So you're gonna aspirate back, make sure that you get some blood and then you're gonna flush because you don't wanna put any air in there. Then there's these protective caps. The white one goes on first. It's gonna anchor this to the skin. The blue one goes on the top. And then you're gonna suture it in place. I put a suture on the skin first to secure it and then I go through the um, the holder in place. And I'll usually put three, sometimes four sutures in to hold it in place. And then I'm gonna put a sterile dressing on the top. I usually just wipe away my goop and make sure that the dressing's gonna stick. I'll put it on. And then on the dressing itself, it says there's a tear here part. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of pull this off while this is covering my line so that it's in place and then I'll take the dressing all the way off. And then I have one more little piece of the dressing which I put on the back side to kind of secure it more into place. I get an x-ray and then my line is okay to use. Cover our face, know, or cover. Face. their face is covered with this, you know. So it's it's pretty. There's no holes or anything in it because where you're putting the hole is just going to be on the neck where you're putting the line in. Yeah. Uh, well, you're watching the monitor, so you'll see like where your wire, like you could see where your wires. But normally, I go anywhere between 15 and 16. I just kind of estimate on the patient. Yeah. Yeah, if they're short, I mean, cause I'd rather have it in a little further than out too much cause you can't push it back in. So if it's not in the right place, 
then you're kind of stuck, right? So if it's in too deep, you can always pull it back a little bit. So. And that's your central line. Yes, they usually come in there. Yeah. They're in the kit, yep. Mm -hmm. So as far as PPE, donning and doffing goes, I'm not sure if these white suits are going to be distributed to everywhere. Is that how? Okay. So what we have right now is on this table. And this is what pretty much everybody's using so far. Um, CDC guidelines does do a specific order of how you're supposed to put stuff on and take it off. It's not that fancy. <laughs> So pretend I don't have a mask on right now because that's not the first thing you put on. Um, the first thing that the CDC wants you to put on is a gown. And um, then you're going to put on your face mask and then your face protection if it's going to be just these goggles or an entire face shield. And then the last thing you're going to put on is your gloves. And this is all done outside of the patient's room. Um, ideally... COVID patients are gonna be in negative pressure rooms. So most of these rooms should have an ante room before you enter the actual patient's room, but that's not always feasible. So as far as taking off the PPE, it's a little bit more complicated because you've just been touching the patient with your gloves. So there's kind of some more steps. You can take your gown and gloves off at the same time. You kind of just pull the gown from the top and just wrap everything up in a ball with your gloves. and what the CDC recommends is if you contaminate your hands anytime throughout this process, you should wash them in between taking something else off. So if you're touching the outside of your gown, it's considered contaminated if you touch that with your bare hands. So they say then wash your hands before you go and take off your goggles is the next step. But if you touch the outside of your goggles, then you're contaminating your hands again. So then you need to wash your hands and then exit the patient room and you take your mask off outside of the patient room. That makes sense. Hopefully in the ante room, but if your patient is not in a negative pressure room, you take your mask off outside the room in the unit. Yeah, everything comes off inside the patient room except the mask. The mask is the last thing to come off. That's why the mask is removed outside the room after everything comes off already. So the mask is the last thing to come off outside of the room. Right. By taking the gown off inside the room? Yeah, yeah theoretically, that's the best that we've got currently. Yep. So what they're saying with the N95s is that you can wear these yellow surgical masks over the N95 and then reuse the N95 five times. So what we're doing in the SICU is people have brown paper bags that you can, you will discard your surgical mask outside of the room still, but then you will keep your N95 mask in your brown bag with you until those five times are up, and then you'll toss it and get another one. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And 
As far as I understand it, yes, that is correct. I don't think so. What they're telling us is to bleach face shields in between patient use. Yeah, so when you're taking off your face shield inside of the anteroom, um, usually you should have bleach in there and you can wipe them down. I think it's just, as long as you're not touching the face shield or contaminating yourself with the face shield, there's no real difference between the face shield or mask. It's just, it's just out, out of the So you can if you want. Yeah, it's the same concept as like wearing the same gloves to other patients' room, like you wouldn't do that, so they want you to change your external wear as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct, yes. Mm-hmm. We're still going by 60 minutes. Yes. Or you have to go in with an N95 mask. Yeah. So I guess there's some differences between the N95 and then the surgical mask. Uh, it kind of depends on if your patient is intubated or if they're getting a nebulizer if they're intubated. It's anything that will produce an aerosolized a aerosolizing procedure, they're going to want you to wear an N95. So if your patient's on BiPAP, right, any nebulizer, even if they're intubated in a closed circuit, but getting a nebulizer, they still want you to wear an N95. And then there's signage that's going around, so everybody that's not directly taking care of the patient knows that the patient has had a respiratory treatment and you should wait X amount of time before going in. Yeah. If, if, it's, if, if they're not getting a treatment. Or if it's not right after intubation. If you're going in and they've been intubated for hours. Mm-hmm. You still do. do. It's just that the N95 is the only difference. Just with the closed circuit, it gets a little confusing. Um, the recommendations, all the information is on the employee toolkit too, as of. should be most some units of okay yeah
Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I know this is wrong, but we don't have these. But when you do the gap, like it's easier to go down. Yeah. What? Okay. And then these we throw out. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yep. So, like uh, for a recommendation, the first time we did it with the regular gown, do it with somebody who's done it. You know, so like I would do it with the nurse to go in together, and then I stayed in there until they gave meds or they did something, and then we took it off together so that I knew I was doing it correctly. Like, mm -hmm. If you can at least help mimic someone or say you're doing it or have done it before. So that someone doesn't go in alone and not understand the procedure. The buddy system is really important because they keep an eye, somebody's keeping an eye on you to make sure you're not contaminating yourself. And, and if you were going into a real biocontainment area like Ebola or something like that, you'd be taking, taping your gloves on, you'd have a hood on, um, it, it, you would make sure that everything is completely sealed off. And it, again, this is this is you know, a little less than Ebola here. This is basically uh, the coronavirus. But once again, keep making sure that you go ahead and, and <clears throat> each step of the way, you're truly um, not cross-contaminating yourself. Having someone watch out for you is so, so important. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah. All the info's on the, oh, yep. Um, I've heard people talk about it, but it, if you take off the gown the right way, you don't really need to double glove, theoretically. Um, I'm not sure what the glove supply is like. I don't know if they're worried about gloves, too. So I don't, it's not part of our current recommendation right now, but that might change. I'm not sure. And look at the employee toolkit if you have any questions. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Doing something there. Okay, so anyone? I don't know. That's okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so for our A-lines, we do treat them sterilely. So we do a hat and mask and um, sterile gloves. Um, most of the time we use the AeroCAF. It's all in one. I don't even think we have a full kit for like an Axe A-line, but um, we do it with sterile towels too. So you open your sterile towels. You dump your catheter in. Always check to make sure that your wire, that it works appropriately. You can, an arm, okay. You can use the ultrasound if you want to. Sometimes it makes it easier. Um, just depends on your comfort level. I'm right-handed, so I like to go on the right if you can, um, if you have a choice. Thanks. Yeah. So you clean off your, with your chloroprep, a couple of chloropreps. Also, I think that the setup is really important, how you have the patient's arm. We always like to tape it on a, a side table if that's available. Kind of always, we prop the wrist up a little bit too. We'll drape our area. You already have sterile gloves on at this point. Normally we make a square. If you're doing it by feel, feel your pulse. I usually like to put two fingers down to feel my pulse. And then another trick is you can do, you do one finger and put the 
um, maximum pulse in the middle of your finger. So where you feel the pulse the strongest, put that in the center of your finger, and then that's where you'll aim your catheter. I don't have a pulse on this guy, but 45 degree angle. Usually bring your table up so you're not completely hunched over. If they're awake and you're nice, you can give a little bit of lidocaine. Don't need that much, just a little wheel. This guy's really stiff. But essentially, I bent my wire. You'll go in, you'll get a flash. You want to see the blood climb up, uh, up your catheter. You know you have really good flow if it climbs um, pretty nicely. If your angle is off, you can drop your angle too once you're in and make sure that you didn't go through and through the vessel. Um, once you're in and you have good flow climbing up, you pass your wire and then you'll pass your catheter over that. Um, then you have your hookup that is either done ahead of time or must be done ahead of time, I guess, by the nurse. Or you can set it up too. Um, you just don't want any air bubbles in there. And you hook it up and check your waveform. If you're doing an axillary, we always use the ultrasound, um, and then that takes more prep. You have to have someone help you hold, hold the arm up or tape the arm up and use your ultrasound, and then that requires a different kit with a longer catheter. Um, but we always start with the wrist first and then go from there. You do have to put a dressing on it. We don't suture in our radials. Some people do. Um, it's just our practice that our, in our unit we don't but you put a, a sorb of view over that. Um, sometimes you can put an extra piece of tape up on the, on the actual tubing. They're not that. <clears throat> this is hard as rock. Sometimes we actually use the, you can actually, you can actually mention, we sometimes can see we actually the use the ultrasound to actually put the A-line in. So sometimes the pulse is very weak, or um, it's just the anatomy is very difficult, so you can actually use the ultrasound to localize the RV as well, and it helps place it. <clears throat> I don't know if this... Um, I think it's recommended. I'm going to be honest, we don't always do it, but I think you know, I mean, if they have good blood flow to their hand and everything. And generally, if you, there's already one bin there, you know, try to go on the other side. If one, you know, fails, you're not going to go right in the same spot. And we don't go for brachial either. So we generally do radials and axillary. So we might be a roughly the same age group. And so the way I look at it, we learned before there was an ultrasound. And so every society that I'm aware of has stopped short of calling the ultrasound the standard of care. Because that has connotations. And so um, well, every society, anesthesiology society, critical care medicine has always recommended the use of it, but do not call it a standard of care. So people, some people feel very comfortable using an ultrasound because they grew up with it and this is, you know, this is, you know, it, it's like a cell phone. But others who do not feel, uh, you know, or, or we don't have one, and if you feel comfortable without it, we're putting in a subclavian or you're putting in an IJ, it doesn't matter. If you feel comfortable, you, f you feel comfortable. <clears throat>
So I, I think what's acceptable is, is always what you feel comfortable with. So I think if you feel comfortable putting in a line, as Dr. Whitbeck probably does without an ultrasound, because he's done 10,000. Um, I'm sure I've done 10,000 without an ultrasound. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, I feel very comfortable using the ultrasound. I think it's very useful in situations where the patient's hypovolemic you're, or you're having difficulty localizing landmarks. But those of us who learned before, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's reasonable to leave it both ways. So again, if, if that's the way you trained is with an ultrasound, do it with an ultrasound. Uh, I would stop short of calling it a standard of care because no society has called it a standard of care. Okay, so we'll go on to the intubation statement. Um, the intubation uh, here is um, we'll be using a glide scope because I think uh, that's the recommended way of intubating in a, in a, in a, a COVID patient is to use the ultrasound and um, uh, the, uh, the glide scope. I'm sorry about that. So the glide scope's over there in the corner. Um, sure. So th this is the bougie, okay, this is what we talked about earlier is the bougie. Uh, this is, it's an adjunct, you don't always use it, okay, you use this when it gets difficult. And um, the way that the bougie goes is, you, there's two ways of doing this, is one, you can either take the bougie and pass it through the cords under direct visualization. Sometimes you have to make a little bit more of a hockey stick, it does have a little memory, it's plastic, but it has a memory to it. So you pass the bougie through the vocal cords. The trachea is anterior, so if you put enough of a hockey stick, uh, a lot of my colleagues have in the past just intubated blindly with the bougie, and it usually goes in the right place. If you put enough of a hockey stick, it goes anteriorly, but that's not always the first sure thing. So most of the time you put this in using direct visualization, and you get it through the cords, and then what you do after that is you then go ahead and you can then pass your endotracheal tube over the bougie. Sometimes what you do, and I, I will be honest with you, uh, the bougie is going to look like that. And when you get to a certain point, this is going to get stuck up in the molecular. Okay, so there's going to be some soft tissue in there. And in order to get this to pass, you sometimes need to rotate the, the tube 100 uh, or 90 degrees to rotate the tube so it actually goes posteriorly and then bring it back anteriorly, and then it'll go right in. Okay, so if you feel it getting stuck, it's not necessarily that it's getting hung up on the vocal cords. It may be that you're hung up on the soft tissue, and then you just rotate it like that, bring it back out like this, and it'll... Um, It'll, it'll go in. So it's almost a kind of a corkscrew movement and you'll get it in there. So you do not always have to use this. You use it for difficult intubations as a bailout tool. Some people actually, uh, when they'll use the bougie, they'll actually line this up and they'll have this ready to go and then they'll put the bougie in and then they'll put this over it. I tend to put the bougie in and then, and then feed it over. So there's two ways of doing it. Um, <clears throat> in terms of airway adjuncts, you should also know about the LMA. So the LMA stands for laryngeal mask airway. And there's a couple of different kinds of LMAs. And so this is, this is one that has, um, uh, th these are single use. Okay, they're not, they're not, I don't think they're being re-sterilized under any circumstances. Do I open this? Yeah. Okay. So um, you, can, you can all come up and, and play with this. This is very useful. So <clears throat> uh, the LMA has, in my experience, uh, saved a number of lives that we could not intubate. Okay, so people who were unable to be intubated could, we were able to get an LMA into the back of their pharynx, and we were able to ventilate them. So usually when you place the LMA in, you, you, you open the mouth, use a you know, tongue depressor, or uh, you can sometimes put your finger in there if they're paralyzed, um, chemically paralyzed. You go ahead, and then you, some people go upside down and turn it around. Okay, that's one way to do it. Some people just pass it in directly. So again, either way works, whichever one works for you under that circumstances. If you're turning it around, sometimes you can actually scrape the, the ceiling of the mouth and get some bleeding. So you gotta be careful about that, but it is very soft. So it sits in the back of the throat, okay, like this. And what it does is it, it, it allows you to ventilate. Um, it does not protect the airway. It allows you to ventilate into the airway. It also, if you're going to be using high pressure, you will be insufflating the stomach and you're at risk for aspiration, right? So the idea is these are really nice adjuncts. One, if you've got a difficult airway and you cannot intubate and you're using this as a bailout tool. And two, if the patient is breathing spontaneously. So we do it in the operating room for patients who are just breathing spontaneously with gas anesthesia and you never have to paralyze them, okay? So the other thing is, is that some of these are intubating LMAs 
And so I think this one might be an intubating LMA. So if you get the LMA into good position, you can sometimes get the LMA in position and then feed uh, another adjunct through uh, like, like the bougie or something similar, and it will go into the, it will then go into the trachea. And then you can use this as a kind of Seldinger technique to get the endotracheal tube in. So there's a number of different uses for an LMA. Okay, it won't go on this one because I think it, and there it goes. It's just a little bit, little bit tight. So once you, you know, if you're in right position and you're ventilating through this, you can sometimes go ahead and you can exchange this LMA for an endotracheal tube. It will buy you some time. So knowing how to place an LMA is an important skill. I believe that in studies in the past, people who have uh, placed an LMA once successfully in training have a 99% chance of uh, placing it successfully in an emergency situation. Okay, so very important if you can't intubate. It does not seal off the airway. It's not considered an airtight seal. So in a COVID situation, you still have to manage particular matter, okay? The patient would still, there'd be an aerosol because it is not a complete seal. It just is sitting in the posterior pharynx. So um, we talked a little bit about um, other adjuncts. This is um, your, so frequently this is how they hand you the stylet. Remember I told you that you're getting, you know, you're focused on this and you get, you got the tube in and somebody's giving you a stylet and you're thinking to yourself, where is this gonna go? Right into someone's eyeball, right? So what you want to do is when you stylet the tube, you never want the stylet to go past the tip of the tube. You want to put a little gentle hockey stick on the end of the stylet like that. And then this part of the stylet, if, if you know, your assistant you know, is thinking ahead of time or you have some time, just bend it back on itself so you don't actually have to worry about poking the patient in the eye. Okay? So that's very, very important to re remember because what, what's, what the person who's intubating is looking at the cords. It may very well be that they couldn't get a number eight in, uh, tube in, and they need a seven and a half, or they couldn't get a seven and a half, they need to put a seven, and someone's restylating the tube, and, and they're just focusing so they don't lose their view, and someone hands you something that looks like this, and you're not even thinking you put it in, and you can cause some damage, okay? So make sure that this is stylated correctly. So, um, so what happens is, we talked earlier, this is, a, uh, this is the Miller blade. It's very long. This is not the one I would usually use. But in any case, um, <clears throat> it, it just clicks together like that. And then you've got a little light. Uh, that's a little bit of a light. And so uh, that would be the Miller blade. And this would be the Macintosh or the Mac blade. And so they go in relatively the same way. The only thing, the only difference is, is that the, um, the Macintosh blade doesn't go all the way to, to the vocal cords, whereas the Miller blade does. And so you have a little bit better direct visualization with, the, with a Miller blade than you do with a, a Macintosh blade under some circumstances. The other thing is you can see that this will occupy more space in the oropharynx than will this. And so it's a little bit harder because you're actually looking around a corner here, whereas you're looking straight in with this. It's a little bit easier. Now remember, you are not passing the endotracheal tube in your line of vision. You're passing it next to your line of vision in both situations, right? So, um, so that's that. The nasal trumpet, um, sort of you, you, you pick one, uh, chances are um, that, uh, you know, technically there's a way of measuring this out, but usually if you're looking for nasal trumpet, you're not actually going to be spending a lot of time measuring it out. Tia, go ahead. It's a matter of style, it's a matter of preference, totally matter of preference. Some people like one over the other. So um, I, I think that now that we're using the GlideScope more, the GlideScope has kind of like a Macintosh blade to it, okay? So it's a curved blade. So more, you know, more, more people are just using that. Uh, some people swear by using the straight blade the first time. Um, it's just one of those things. Uh, it, it's really just a matter of style. A lot of it had to do with how you were trained as well. Um, and so when you take the nasal trumpet, what the nasal trumpet does is, it, bless you, it allows you to, um, it, so it, in somebody who's awake, it's really hard to put it in, okay? They're gonna resist you, and it's actually a really good way to find out if somebody is awake or not. But what you do is, is that you can go ahead and just slide it right back in, and of course, if you get resistance, you kind of stop and try to wiggle it in. But once you've got it in like this, what it does is it splints the airway open so that the soft tissues of the tongue don't fall against the, uh, the, the palate, and therefore you're able to move some air, air using the nasal trumpet. And a lot of times you'll see people like this coming out of anesthesia, and they'll have a nasal trumpet in, because what will happen is there's still a little bit of pundit in the recovery room, and then what happens is they start to wake up, we just pull it out, okay? So it's, it's relatively commonly used in the operating room. So if, you, uh, so if you're intubating, usually what, what happens is the, um, so the LMA in, in, in this particular case, it's gonna be really hard to place this LMA into the plastic, but in any case, you either go in this way and turn it around or you just go in straight, and it will seat itself 
in the back of the tongue. And what happens is the way you will do it is you will push it until it sort of pops. And there's a little pop. And then when you inflate it, you, you're going to usually use about 20, 20 cc's or so there. When it inflates, it pops out just a little bit. And that tells you it's in good position. Okay, So the, the, the popping out is really a good sign. The, um, if, you're, if you're intubating with, um, with a blade, uh, let's say you, this one's ready here. So if we're going to use this, it's a, it's a, it's a left-handed tool. So you're using this in your left hand. And what you're going to do is you're going to be using the um, endotracheal tube will be in your right hand. So what's going to happen is as you're, you know, if, it's, if it's, you know, it is a team sport once again, so your, your first assistant will be there and, and basically making sure um, that, you know, you get the tube, you get direct visualization. The idea here is as you put this in the, in the mouth, what you want to do is, you know, if you visualize the corner of the room, like in a regular patient room, and you actually kind of move toward the corner in like a 45 degree angle, okay, that'll take you to the corner of the room. So what you're doing is you're not putting it in and turning it because you're going to crack teeth, okay? You want to make sure that the lips aren't caught because if you get bleeding, that'll be an issue, okay? So you go in, you go in, you go in, and you just kind of lift, 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 and you're pushing up toward the corner of the room like that until you see the vocal cords. And then sometimes what you have to do is you have to advance a little bit more. And I'll tell you honestly, uh, every time I've ever taken ACLS, it's harder to intubate the dummy than it is to intubate a real person because nothing in here is lubricated. And so usually in a, in a, in a real situation, it just goes and sl slips right through the cords, okay? So <clears throat> that's, the, um, that's the typical, that's the direct laryngoscopy. Okay, so if you're going to use a video laryngoscope, which is our glide scope, it's broken. Um, it's broken. So the glide scope is broken, so we won't be able to use that. But what the glide scope will do is you put it in very similar to a regular, um, to a regular laryngoscope. And what you do is what you, you don't, you, you'll be able to see it on the monitor. And the nice thing about the GlideScope and the reason we're using the GlideScope in the COVID situation is you don't have to get so close. You can imagine how close I have to get to this person before I put, before I put the tube in. On a GlideScope, I could be standing here and put, passing the tube in from much further away. So there's an extra distance, a little safety, which allows that to sort of protect me from things. Now, the other thing is you want to make sure in COVID that the patient is completely paralyzed and anesthetized before because you don't want them to cough in your face, okay? So one of the things that we talked about before, interestingly enough, each one of these ventilator bags comes with, uh, each one of the ventilators comes in a ventilator bag, okay? So if you were going to use this ventilator bag, what you would do is you would go ahead and potentially make a little hole like that and then pop this over the patient. And then what you could do is, just like the video showed, you could take this, put this on the patient's face like that, so you'd, you'd have the mask on here. You'd put the mask through the hole, which is if you make it you know, the right size, it's a very small hole right to start with. And then what you've got is you've basically got a self-contained circuit in here. So you're, even though the patient's not yet intubated, there might be some secretions flying around. But that helps you prevent, especially during pre-oxygenation. Because you're going to have to pre-oxygenate for two, three, four, five minutes before some of these patients get to be an acceptable SAT. Okay? So the thing is, a lot of times these folks especially once you anesthetize them, they will desaturate very, very quickly. They have no functional reserve. And so you're going to, you're going to want to make sure, and, and through this, you can see them, you can see their face, and you can, you can do all your jaw lift or your, your thrust maneuvers, and you can ventilate the patient very nicely, but it's just one added level of protection. And remember, just like the video showed, we can actually go ahead and extubate under similar circumstances. And so, again, it's one added level of protection. So, so the way that you're going to mask ventilate this patient is you set up um, your, your bag. And um, at this point, hopefully either stuff is ready for you or you're getting it set up. So you've got all your little things get ready to go. You'll, you, know, you walk into the room. If somebody hands you this, it's already connected to a bag, a reservoir bag. Someone connects it to the oxygen outlet, make sure the oxygen is on once again. And so to take this off of here, what you want to do is you want to be able to, you know, sort of lift the, lift the patient's uh, jaw upward, and you do that with your fingers. And then what you do is you go ahead and you tighten this on real tight like this. So basically, this is, this is my fingers. Uh, just, like, just like the video showed, my fingers are all white at the tip because you're actually pulling up pretty hard. And then what you're doing is you can see the chest rising um, and you're ventilating. Um, again, uh, looking for condensation in the mask is not a for sure sign that you're ventilating, 
okay? It could be that uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. It could get condensation without actually uh, being uh, passing any air into the lungs at all. So, uh, so you, that's it. And once you've got your endotracheal tube in, it's secured, and then Sean comes and sets up the ventilator for us. Uh, are there any questions on that? Yep. Okay. Uh, Tia. Uh -huh. Right. ACLS resuscitation, it, nothing changed, okay? So the, the only difference that I would suggest is that if you do have a barrier sheet, okay, one of the things people have used is to actually take a converter sheet, one of these blue converter sheets like this, and what happens is you can use this to cover the patient, actually protect folks, okay? So again, um, it is, it, it, it's just one of those things, even though uh, the endotracheal tube is in, sometimes, you know, there's st still a lot of secretions flying around, what you can do is that you can actually do your resuscitation under a sheet like this, or even if you have the bag, okay, the clear plastic bag, okay? Again, what you would have done is you would have gone under here, you would have attached your paddles and your monitors, and then what you'd be doing is you'd be, you'd be watching. And uh, again, um, the idea here would be hopefully that you're not arcing and not setting fire to everything, but you wouldn't set fire to the patient's gown either, right? So the bottom line is you make sure that everything is as, as, as clean as you possibly can be, and then that, that way you're doing it under a protected setting. It's just one added level of protection. And I think so, you know, sometimes that makes a big difference. Um, so uh, any, oh, there's one other question, yes. <clears throat> yeah, so what happens is that if you look at the anesthesiologists, the anesthesiologists are intubating every single person, uh, known COVID or non, you know, unknown, um, uh, or, or all comers that could be fairly healthy coming in for surgery, uh, they're using full protective gear. Uh, they use PAPRs in the OR. They use the, uh, the, the, the mask with the recycle, uh, the, the filtered air. So um, the fact is that um, I, I think any time that you're handling a patient who it might be, it's the unknown unknowns, remember? So um, in the ICU, what we're doing is we're using full protective gear to intubate everybody. So it's interesting how, it's interesting, you know, I, I think, uh, Tia, you have your work cut out for you, I'm so sorry, but it is, it is so true. Um, the fact is that any anesthesiologist going to a code in this hospital is going with full PPE, including a, a, a PAPR, and they are not showing up at a code without that, okay? So um, that, is, that is true, and I talked to Dom Cortez last week, and that is the way it's being done. So um, again, how, how, how are we doing it versus what we could be doing or should be doing? I think it's the unknown unknowns that are going to be the problem. I think making sure that you and your staff are well protected, I think that's the key, okay? So again, it's not just about me, it's about the patient, the people around me all taking care of the patient. And I wanna make sure that I reduce the risk of exposure as much as possible. Okay. So, <clears throat> so, so what happens is, is that, yeah, that's, it, it's interesting, Lindsay, uh, Lindsay, correct me if I'm wrong, but the way that it's done here is that the um, anesthesiologist and the circulator are actually gowned up while the airway is being secured. Everybody else is out of the room, not just four feet away. And they are out of the room for four minutes, five minutes, some, some, ar some arbitrary number, all right? And so what happens is when that arbitrary number is over, uh, then they come back in. And, and, and at that point, we consider A, the particles to have either settled or to have been evacuated because the room is being turned over so often in terms of its, of its error. So I, I, I believe that everybody else leaves the room when the airway is being secured. And the same is true at extubation. The only, the only people in the room are the circulator and the anesthesiologist, or the anesthesia provider, I should say. And what happens is that the anesthesia provider has the, you, know, the, the, you, know, you need help. So when you extubate someone, they go into laryngospasm, you don't want to be running to the door to tap on the door to look for help. You want someone in there who can help support you while, you're, you, want, while you got your hands full. And that's why it's a two-person job. And the same is true with a difficult airway. So if you're having a difficult airway, the anesthesiology provider in the room will be um, looking for help, 
Okay, it could be that all of a sudden, you know, patient is, you know, regurgitating and somebody needs to give cricoid pressure or the patient develops, uh, you know, laryngospasm and you're looking for another drug or bronchospasm uh, or something happens and that's why the, it's, it's always a two-person job and they're out of the room for, I believe it's four minutes. I, I, don't hold me to that, but that's, you know, it is an arbitrary number of minutes. And, and so, you know, I, again, I always wonder, well, who came up with that number? It sounded like a good number at the time. I, I'll go with it. So that's, that's about it. Any other questions? Okay, wonderful. So um, I think, uh, Tia, where to next? Sean, okay. Sean, you're up. Okay, uh, so now that your patient is intubated, you gotta put the patient on a ventilator and there's nobody here to do it for you. So what do you have to do? Um, you got to hook the ventilator up to the wall outlets, the oxygen, the electricity, the air. Um, then you got to turn it on. There is a switch in the back that'll turn the power on, but that doesn't actually turn the ventilator on yet. Next thing you got to do, there's a switch over here that will take the ventilator and uh, turn the screen on. Then all you got to do is hit start ventilation, and, and the ventilator will start running. Um, I get asked a lot, what, you know, what tidal volume do I start a ventilator out at? Um, the FCCS says to start a the tight your tidal volume at 8 to 10 mLs per kg. ArgeNet says 6 to 8 mLs per kg. 8's covered in both of them. I start every tidal volume on every ventilator I turn on at 8 mLs per kg. That way, if they happen to be showing ARDS characteristics, I'm still in the range where they want it. If they aren't, I'm still in the range that the Society of Critical Care Medicine says to be in. Um, from there, you can titrate up or down, depending upon your needs. Um, the rate you set, 12 to 15, or 12 to 16 breaths a minute. Um, you guys will be setting ventilators up in acute situations. So again, 100% FiO2. Um, you can start at five a peep. If your, ox if your saturation isn't improving on 100% and five a peep, you wanna go up on the peep. If you find that your patient with your x-ray and your blood gas and uh, your history, you think that patient might have ARDS, you're not gonna to wanna to leave them on 100% and five a peep. Um, so you're gonna to wanna to go up on the peep. So then you'll look at the yards net peep table. Um, what I can tell you, I don't have the table memorized, um, but what I do know is that if you're on 100%, your PEEP is probably gonna be somewhere between 16 and 20 on the low PEEP setting table and 18 and 24 on the high setting. So um, you'll probably be setting a PEEP that's really pretty high if you still need 100%. Um, the... Uh, when you set your rate, um, well, the next thing you want to do after you got your ventilator, your initial settings in is uh, about 20 minutes, a half an hour after your ventilator is up and running, you want to get a blood gas. And from there, you're going to interpret your blood gas. If you're acidotic, um, you're going to make changes to, to correct that as best you can. Um, so you'll either go up on the rate, you'll go up on the tidal volume. Um, usually we use the rate because it's a little bit more predictable. Uh, but if you go up on the rate too high, you can, you can cause air trapping, um, which will create a whole different set of problems for you. Um, the, uh, the next part of the, uh, of it is, uh, um, you know, you'll look at your blood gas, you look at your PO2, adjust your FiO2 accordingly. Um, and so that's how really you get your, your blood gas, your, your ventilator up going and, and on your patient. One of the things we're finding with these COVID patients is that they don't, they get sicker in increments quickly, but once you get them on the ventilator and you get their PEEP stabilized, they don't get better quickly. So you're going to get onto a, you know, this patient, he's going to be on, you know, 80% and 
and 15 a peep. And he may be there for a couple of days, and he just isn't going to get better. Um, it's on average, the, the COVID patients are sitting on ventilators for 10 to 14 days. Um, so if you just intubated somebody, chances are better that you're not going to be able to get them off the ventilator in the next couple of days if they're a COVID positive patient. So, um, you know, don't, uh, don't fool yourself into thinking that you are. Um, so really managing the ventilator is not that hard. You get a blood gas, you make a change. You, you know, you get a blood gas, you make a change, or you just leave things alone. There's no, um, there's no real um, rationale to it. Now, if you have a patient who, who acutely decompensates, uh, you know, your, your ventilator's going along, it's running just fine, and all of a sudden, your peak airway pressures are really, you know, really high. They're 40, 45, you know, 50 centimeters of water pressure. And your ventilator's alarming. Um, that's, that's obviously an acute emergency, and so you have to kind of diagnose that problem. Um, one of the first things you can do is, is when you walk into the room is, is just quickly try and suction the patient. If you go and you advance the suction catheter into the into the uh, endotracheal tube and, it, and it, you hit an obstruction, well, now you probably know why your your uh, ventilator is high pressure limiting. So the next thing you want to do is you advance it. You suction on the way out. If you get a uh, a bunch of secretions on the way out, then you know maybe that was your problem. So so if you just by simply trying to pass a suction catheter and suctioning the patient you have um, potentially either fixed a problem or diagnosed a problem, and it takes half a second. It's, it's super quick, it's super easy. Um, then from there, you know, auscultate your patient. If the patient has the breath sounds in one side of their chest and none in the other, you know, do you have a pneumo? Has your tube migrated? Um, so you wanna, you know, evaluate that. Uh, maybe you need a chest X-ray. Uh, maybe your patient is just agitated. Um, maybe your patient has, you know, so look at your, abdo your abdomen. Maybe your patient has had something bad happen in their abdomen and you now have abdominal compartment syndrome. Um, you know, there are a whole lot of things you could do. So, it, um, you know, you want to rapidly assess the, the situation as best you can. And, and uh, barring that, if, if you have high peak airway pressures, um, you can turn down the tidal volume. If the high peak airway pressure is from auto peep, you can turn, out, turn down the rate, you can turn down the eye time, and maybe that will help um, alleviate the problem if it's auto peep. Um, do you guys have any questions? Um, yes. Well, we kind of briefly talked about the peak airway pressure alarm, but the other alarms you're going to set, um, you're going to set a high and a low minute volume alarm. And um, there's no high, low tidal volume alarm in this ventilator. So, so just the minute volume alarm, and it kind of works as a de facto um, tidal volume alarm. Um, so you'll set your minute volume. Um, if the minute volume alarm is, is alarming because it's high, um, usually that's your patient is just agitated. Um, they may need some sedation. Um, some other conditions, you know, may cause the tidal volume, high tidal volume alarm to go off. Um, such as if your patient is, is spiking a fever and they're trying to compensate and, and uh, you know, so they're, they're trying to uh, maintain a high minute volume to compensate for, say, a metabolic acidosis. Um, low minute volume alarms, that will alarm along with the peak airway pressure due to um, coughing, obstructed tube. Um, it will alarm for leaks. It will alarm if your patient is, uh, 
if your compliance has changed or your, you know, you, if your lung has become less compliant, your low minute volume alarm may go off. Um, if your resistance has gone way up, your low minute volume alarm may go off. Especially, and those things are especially in pressure control. Um, because as with pressure control uh, ventilation, the pressure stays constant and um, so changes, because pressure is constant, changes in compliance or resistance will either cause the tidal volume to go up or down. Um, so in pressure control, those alarms are very important. Um, the other thing you Um, so there's also uh, respiratory rate alarm, low and high. Um, you're probably going to deal with patients that are mostly being fully supported. So um, the low rate alarm, because you have a, a actual set rate on the ventilator, isn't isn't really important. It's not going to go off. You know, you'll never if you're on assist control set to 12 and you set the uh, low rate alarm to eight, it's never going to go off. So it's really a non-functional. Um, but the high rate, I'm sorry? Uh, they have, you can take and push auto set and it will set the alarms based on the parameters of the patient at that time. Um, usually it's, you know, plus minus 10% or plus minus two liters or whatever it is on the particular alarm. Um, The high rate alarm, though, is going to alarm. It can alarm for you know various reasons. It will alarm if there are a lot of secretions in the endotracheal tube. It will cause this particular ventilator to auto cycle a little bit, so you may get a high alarm. Um, if the patient is breathing quickly for whatever reason, it's going to alarm. Um, if the patient becomes disconnected, it will auto cycle and and may cause a high rate alarm. So there are a couple of different reasons for it to, for your ventilator to um, auto cycle, or for your ventilator, your high rate alarm to, to go off. John, would you take us through an algorithm to say, okay, fair enough, now the, the peak airway pressure is alarming. I don't know how to change the compliance here, but uh, you want compliance. more compliant? Uh, I want less compliant. Uh, this is as, as this, this is low less as, compliant. this is as low So let's as say low, your peak so. airway pressure is alarming. And so what's, what's your algorithm? What are the five things that you want to do first to get in there and, and, and see why the peak airway pressure is going Um I don't know that there's a, a one through five um, per se, you know, because it, a lot of things kind of happen almost at the same time. Um, you walk into a room you look at the ventilator, your peak airway pressure alarm is going on. First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to, um, you know, walk in, I'm going to grab the endotracheal tube, I'm going to pass the suction catheter, but I'm also looking at the patient. You know, was the patient bearing down? Are they agitated? Are they coughing? Um, you know, I'm looking at those things while I'm trying to feel if the patient has secretions and whatnot. And then if that doesn't fix it, I grab the stethoscope and I listen. Uh, my part really after that is if I listen to the to the guy's chest and, and I don't hear anything, you know, my part is to just go and tell you, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to order the chest x-ray and, you know, go from there. After it gets above my pay grade, I hand it off to the next guy. So again, I think the first thing you want to do is pass the suction catheter, then indicate that the endotracheal tube is peaked. 
So if you can't have suction catheters, you know, tube is pink. We've had a couple of those recently, yep. right? Pink is the, uh, the bite block, for example. Or sometimes what happens is patients biting down. Okay, that could be a problem. So if you're biting out the entire sedation, right? Sometimes you're doing it unconsciously, and they, you can't stop them from doing it without sedation. Uh, the other thing is you want to be looking for the, the, the critical thing. The critical thing is actually you want to be looking for the endotracheal tube. First of all, make sure that there's not a mucous clog. And that's for another reason to the suction the catheter. And sometimes you have to irrigate as well as suction. So uh, Sean will come by with one of those little sterile saline things and kind of throw it down the endotracheal tube. And if there's some secretions in there, then you can mobilize that secretion. The other thing are the life threatening causes, right? So the life threatening causes we keep there with the record. Number one thing that you're thinking about is probably. Tension pneumothorax in, in, in the enterprise group of supervised uh, is, is, you know, especially when you're talking about feet, right? So, you know, you've got to be prepared to do tension pneumothorax. How are you going to do that? Well, you're going to go ahead and you're going to get a needle, you're going to put it through the second nuclear process space, you're going to do the anterior you know, uh, radicular line, and you're going to sort of decompress that. And once you've done that, the next thing you're going to do is set up for chest, right? Because now you've got a hole. So, the fact is, you've got to be prepared to go through the algorithm by this time you're calling for help. Next thing you're thinking about, maybe what we talked about earlier, Donald and Parkinson, the foreign insurance lines are new. And certainly, the peak airway pressure is rising. It doesn't usually happen so acutely, but it could get to the point where peak airway pressures are certainly a sign of um, uh, an abdominal and Parkinson's syndrome. So those are probably the key life-threatening causes of uh, peak airway pressure. Am I missing any? So the thing is, is that, yeah, I, Obviously, in, in a normal situation, a normal low, the first thing that you should be doing is ventilating the patient on me. Take the patient off the ventilator and start dying. That's a good thing for a couple of reasons. One, you can feel the compliance of the lung. And two is, is that you know, you now take, you've now taken over the right? So if it's a machine malfunction, you're not waiting for this machine malfunction to correct itself. Like now you're in a situation where you can control it. The thing is, when you're taking somebody off the ventilator and starting on a charge room or a pelvic room, that's a whole different We just leave, we just leave the patients on the ventilator they're on. This ventilator will make it to CT scan with plenty of battery life. Uh, the other one, the LTV, is it is a transport ventilator. So, um, yeah, we, we don't even take the – our goal here is to break the circuit as few times as possible, and that was even before SARS-CoV-2. Um, you know, we don't – because breaking the circuit is associated with a loss of PEEP and recruitment, but also increased pneumonia rates in patients. So – we try not to break the circuit unless we absolutely have to. Um, we try not to bag them on the way down. Whatever. That's, 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 
we have a lot of road trips tonight. Uh, the one that works. Most of them are winding up on pressure control. Yep. Um, one of the advantages of pressure control is you get better ventilation throughout the entire lung. Um, PRVC is, is a hybrid mode that is um, it's a pressure control breath with a volume guarantee, so to speak set a tidal volume and ventilator adjust pressure, the ventilating pressure to achieve that volume. Um, in a perfect world, it's a perfect mode, but patients are never perfect. Um, so if they become under sedated or agitated, or for whatever reason they have a high demand, um, PRVC, the way the, the mode works will tend to um, under support patients because the ventilator doesn't know the difference between a tidal volume of 600 with a compliant lung or a tidal volume of 600 from a patient that's gasping. Vent just doesn't know, vent doesn't care. Well, we're going to bring everybody down. <clears throat> I think it's time to play with the, the dials and watch the flashing lights. I'm going to play scientist. I think this is, you're not going to get the hang of this until you actually come down to the hands on. So we want everybody to come on down and try to take us through some. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay.